Welcome class. Today we're going to be talking about Gregory Mendel's classic pea plant experiments. It's obviously a game changer in terms of genetics. At that time and several thousands of years before that, many farmers and ranchers always were selecting their best out of their herds or, or the crops to make improvements in production. And it was kind of a haphazard deal, kind of a hit and miss, primarily because nobody at the time, even scientists, really didn't understand the mechanics behind inheritance and genetics. Gregory Mendel changed all of that. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. How did he do it and what types of techniques did he use? Before we do that, I'd like to uh, show you a, um, a short five-minute video about Gregory Mendel and in particular his, his experiments and, and his uh, work with pea plants. A lot of people didn't really understand it all that well, um, but he was very consistent. He applied things like botany. He applied things like um, mathematics to science that very few people did. He was kind of a renaissance man to a degree. Um, the Pearson publishers who put this, this video together is featuring the eco gates and they kind of put a funny spin on Gregory Mendel and his, and his experiments. So I hope you'll enjoy it and I'll see you back in about five minutes. Gregor Mendel. All right, stay close behind. We need to get this story. Uh, Mr. Mendel. Oh, hello. Oh, hello. I'm glad you can make it. <laughs> um, we're, if it's all right with you, we're just going to set up the shot here. Sure. Okay, just um, make sure you're close. And that concludes our story of the newly freed serfs in Russia. Next in the headlines, reports of surface of a monk 200 kilometers from Prague who has been growing and experimenting with plants. Now, this may sound like an innocent hobby, but some are saying that this man has taken his hobby to what many consider fanatic proportions. Rumors suggest that this monk has been growing ordinary garden pea plants by the thousands. We'll turn to our reporters in the field to uncover the truth about this man with an extraordinary hobby. Are you there, Haley? Yes, and hello. We are indeed talking about one man's incredible interest in garden peas, in all shapes and colors, it seems. I'm here with the man of a thousand peas, Monk Gregor Mendel. Gregor, tell us about this hobby of yours. Well, it's true. I have been growing pea plants for the past eight years now, mm -hmm. but I must confess, it has turned into much more than a hobby. <laughs> yes. Would you say that it's grown into <laughs> a bit of a hobby? Yes. Yes, I would. <laughs> yes. Now, I've heard that you've grown over 28,000 pea plants. That's a little excessive. Why so many? Well, I needed that many to make a historical discovery that will change the world. Yes, uh, because pea plants are good for people for health reasons, yes? <laughs> Heavens, no. Uh, my discovery will change the way scientific research is done forever. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, oh, you haven't read my research, have you? I. It's better if I show you. Come, this way. Um, I. Come. Now, what do you see? Um. Peas. You are right. Now, look at this one. Here's a yellow one. There's a green one. Some are smooth, some are wrinkled, yet they are all part of the same species. Now, when I crossbred the different types, I realized that some traits skipped a generation, and then some also reappeared in later generations. Now, I couldn't accept that this was happening just by chance. So, I first grew plants, making sure that the offspring were always the same. Then I started crossbreeding the different traits to make hybrids. I found that some traits disappeared in some generations, then come back in later generations with predictable patterns that I could calculate mathematically. I called the traits that disappeared in some generations recessive, while the traits that did not disappear dominant. I concluded that every trait must be controlled by two predictable elements. Do you understand? This study is telling us that we can predict inheritance traits of everything alive. Yes, uh, you have been looking at a lot of peas, uh, but granted, a, a lot of peas, but uh, peas. Yes, peas. Peas. Well, there you have it. Reporting to you from Brune in 1864. Next time, we'll be coming to you from the fronts of the American Civil War. Back to you, Suze. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Mendel. You're welcome. Great and, talking uh, to you. I should yes. be getting more recognition than Darwin for any of the stuff that I'm doing here. Yes, good luck with that. Gregor Mendel, I will. Thank you. Yes. Uh, okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. Peace be with you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, I'll be very peaceful here in my garden. <laughs> So Mendel's time sure did come after all, although he was not alive to get the appreciation that he really deserved. His research was rediscovered in the beginning of the 1900s by European botanists and set off a scientific revolution. So the research on those little garden peas led to the discipline of genetics and brought about Mendel's principles of inheritance. But you know what, those little elements that Mendel concluded were controlling our traits, well, today we know them as genes. Early scientists often experienced hard times, getting the importance of their work accepted, but that didn't stop them from asking questions that led to breakthroughs of great importance. And as always, we encourage you to do the same, because you could hold the answers to tomorrow's discoveries. Gregor Mendel here from 1864, encouraging you to never stop exploring your world. Peace out. Well, that was a nice little interlude, a humorous interlude that, that we could uh, hopefully share. But I hope that you kind of got from it the three steps. So that's what I really want to go over is those three steps to make Gregory Mendel's experiments happen. Um, but before we do that, you might want to be wondering why peas? You know, what, 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 uh, uh, why did he choose those? First of all, they were really available. He was an Austrian monk. And one of his duties as a monk was to take care of the gardens, and in particular the vegetable gardens. So he had lots of peas. And peas have a real short generation time so that he could grow them at different parts of the year very, very quickly. Other thing about uh, pea plants is he could, um, he could take them and manipulate them uh, reproductively because all of their reproductive organs are all on one flower. So you have male and female um, organs all on one flower. So he was able to manipulate them using cross-pollination or self-pollination. The other thing uh, that, that was kind of going for him as well was, like I said before, he was a bit of a mathematician, obviously a little bit of a scientist, and he was able to combine those things uh, on pea plants. And he didn't just look at, you know, like for instance flower color, he looked at pod color, pod length, he looked at the shape of seeds, um, so he did a lot of different kinds of experiments and looked at lots of different traits on this particular plant. So he definitely used all of his resources that, that were uh, really handy for him. But the very first thing that Gregory Mendel recognized, and he was a great observer, by the way, of, uh, as far as a scientist was concerned, he noticed that all of his pea plants either had white flowers or purple flowers. So that was one of the first things that he wanted to, um, to, to measure. Because the t at that time, genetics basically said that these factors or elements, as they call them, blended together. They came together, and there was blend. There was no necessary pure trait. Um, so when genetic material got together, it just, for the most part, kind of mixed and mingled like, mingled like paint, and so you got kind of a blending of of the two different traits. But he wanted to test that theory, but. Before he did that, he wanted to make sure that he could create a generation of seeds that always bred true. And with two only two different colors, he thought that would be relatively easy to do. So again, manipulating uh, the, the plant's uh, reproductive organs to kind of fit his, his particular um, uh, goal is he took the pollen off of one flower and put it back into that same flower on the, the pistil, which is the female component. And he did that for several um, uh, several generations. And he, the, when he put the pollen, he had to bag them. And when he bagged them, that way it prevented from any kind of cross-pollination or other pollen coming on. So when he did that, when he did the self-pollinization, he allowed the, the ovaries or the seed pods to grow and mature. And when they were ripe, he could take out those seeds and over several uh, generations he was able to create a purebred strain of purple plants in other words all those plants would have purple flowers and then a strain of white flowered plants so he created that so with that foundation of his of his experiment done he could now go to the, uh, the second step so the first step he created a parental purebred strain of pea plants 
The second part is he now wanted to create hybrids, crossbreds, if you will. So what he would do is he would take, for instance, a purple plant, take the pollen off of a purple flowered plant, and go to a white flowered plant and deposit the pollen into those white flowers. Bag those up, allow the ovaries to mature, ripen, and then harvest the seeds. And when he did that, kind of to his surprise, they were all purple, all of them. But the one thing that he, he saw that they were all purple, they weren't blended. So in a way, um, it was kind of going against what the genetics of the day were saying, that some of the scientists were saying is there's a blending. He didn't see any difference in color. Obviously, there's always a little bit of variation in purple, but they were still purple. They weren't kind of a chartreuse or a mixed uh, a color. It, they were all true purple. And he called this generation the F1, the first filial generation. So the first generation was the parental strain where he created a purebreds. Second, he cr uh, created some crossbreds that all were purple. It got him to thinking, like, what happened to that white flower? I know it was in there, but where did it go? So he created this third level of experiment, his second, excuse me, his third step. And his third step is called the F2, the second filial generation. And this time, he wanted to see where all of that, that white trait went, so he self-pollinated all the purple plants. So he got those particular F1s, and he self-fertilized uh, all the purple flowers in that generation, um, that the F1s, and then it wasn't really a surprise to him in terms of seeing the white flower again, but what was a surprise to him was the consistency in which the white always appeared. So from the F1, which were all purple, he self-pollinated those, that's F2, and we, we saw that, or he saw that there were three purples to one white each and every time. So he kind of surmised that, number one, is that element happens in pairs, and second of all, when they're pairing up, there must be a dominant trait set up. So purple, in this particular case, must be dominant over white, which is, of course, recessive. So he created this uh, kind of a new language as well as a, a, as a new look as far as how Gen X would be viewed. You'd, first of all, you'd apply, obviously, mathematics. And this mathematics showed us that there was consistent traits that were inherited at certain levels. And there was also in these factors, these genes, obviously genes that were more dominant over the other ones, didn't necessarily blend, at least in uh, Mendel's experiment. We do know that some traits do blend, but fortunately for him, the ones that he studied didn't blend. Uh, they were kind of called simply inherited traits. So that his particular experiments were definitely, as I said before, really game-changing in the science of genetics. So uh, the F2 uh, allow, allowed him to see dominant traits and recessive traits. Now, what were some of the conclusions he came up with with experiments like that? Uh, first of all, there were factors or genes as we now know them, and one was inherited from father and one from mother. And these factors or units are passed on unchanged from generation to generation. And there are sometimes traits don't show up. For instance, in this particular case, the white flower didn't show up. It was always the purple. But in certain conditions, however, that lost or recessive trait will show up. And when it shows up, it's going to show up in its basically unchanged state time after time again. But again, they show up in predictable patterns. For instance, in this case, to be recessive, it had to have two factors or those two alleles coming together to, uh, to in a recessive condition to actually show it. Now, the principles that I'm going to be talking about in the next couple of videos is segregation and independent assortment. So make sure you see those because then um, we're going to be working out all the, in the uh, um, Punnett squares, all this, not only the science but also the mathematics that, that really uh, allowed uh, Gregory Mendel to come into prominence in the early 1900s. So I hope that uh, helped out and helped clear up some of the reasons why Gregory Mendel used pea plants and how he set up his, his labs. So next time, we'll see you in the lab. Thanks. Bye.